and action. All right, so we're gonna go into really the language of investors today. So yes, 1031 exchange and what that is, but really I wanna, I'll dive a little bit deep into that, but also just some general points to where you will know more than 90% of agents just by being able to speak this language. Uh, your typical agent isn't gonna know what half of it is. So uh, first getting into it, um, investors, when they want to work with you, there's different types of investors that are out there. Understand, investors are not, they shouldn't be, they should, they're not emotional in these buys. The numbers have to be the numbers, and if the numbers work, then the deal works. Like they don't look at something, fall in love with it, I have to have it if the numbers don't make sense. If the numbers make sense, it works. Most of us on the residential side, we're used to dealing with people making emotional decisions, um, emotional sales, emotional buys. I can see my family here. I can raise it. It's, it's very personal. It's emotional. The investors, this mo this property makes this much money. It's in this type of area. This works at this price. Well, can you do 5000 more? No. Oh, sad. No, it's not sad. The deal doesn't work. See ya. I think oh, uh, everyone's... Uh, most hated or loved president Donald Trump said if the deal is, is not good it's bad so don't take the deal so it's like you hear that there's a deal if it's a bad deal then it shouldn't be a deal you should do and I'm like oh I got a bad deal on this and don't do it so um, something real quick out of the gate this hasn't existed in the past two or three years but you'll see new investors throw it out it's called the 1% rule has anybody heard that before 1% rule thrown out there 1% rule means that the monthly rent needs to be a percent of the purchase price. So if I have a $100,000 property, it needs to be able to rent for $1,000 a month. Now that is not a universal metric. That's just a good like rule of thumb, like, okay, I'll look at it. I have not seen that in about, seriously, three years. And the stuff that I'm seeing go on the market is going nowhere close to it. There is a duplex that was bought right here, you looked at it. Yeah. It was three hundred thousand dollars. Dude bought a cash, no inspection. It's actually my forehead. He's an investor, so uh, he's a lender as well. He bought it for three hundred thousand. The rents on both sides. If I really jacked them up, maybe I could get eleven hundred. So that's twenty two hundred. It was still bought for three hundred thousand. So that one percent rule doesn't apply there. So if that's your only metric, then the, the investor is very new. Sometimes people will say two percent rule. I mean, but, but, yeah. <laughs> Just know that. So if somebody goes out there, I'm looking for the 1% rule, then you have the ability to be able to at least speak into that and say, okay, what are you more worried about? Are you wanting to focus on your cash flow? Or are you wanting your cash on cash return on investment to be good here? Or are you more worried about the appreciation that could potentially be there? Because your investors are going to come at it at a three-prong approach. See, I'm a school brat. I like to have it all. I like cash flow and I like appreciation and <laughs> I like the property to be taken care of, and that's what I want to go for. I'm not so ballsy that I will buy a place and hope that it will appreciate, but this is the language that you speak. So what I mean by cash flow is I have a mortgage on a property. It is $1,000. The rents bring in after, the rents bring in $1,500. The sexy cash flow I have here is $500. Now I call this sexy cash flow I'm gonna coin that because that's exactly what it is. It's sexy. It's like, ooh, 500. We have property management fees. We have taxes, insurance. We have uh, vacancy rates put in, and we have uh, just regulatory like maintenance that comes in. And so, if it's a beat up property, that you can be negative cash flow rather quickly because you didn't underwrite the deal well enough. So that investor, as you're looking at it, you're saying, okay, great. And what that. What that is outside of the cash flow here is called CapEx. So what are your capital expenditures? That means improving the property right out of the gate. So if you go look at a duplex and the roof needs to be replaced and the heat pumps need to be replaced, you're going to have to, if you want to sound like a big old investor agent, you can say, what is your CapEx plan for this? What's your budget? Typically, people will do 15 to 20% of the purchase price as a CapEx fund of things that comes up. When you're buying a property, and most investors are buying something that they're going to flip up. They're going to improve it and then jack rents up. That's how you make 
massive net worth gains in this business. It's not by buying Class A properties at top dollar and holding on to it and hoping that the market goes up. It's buying, so Class A is your brand new construction, stainless steel appliance, uh, granite countertops, all that stuff. And I'll jump into those classes later. But essentially folks are buying it. So one of those buzzwords is capital expenditure. Like what's gonna be your CapEx budget for this property? And if they kind of go cross-eyed, like, I mean, like, what are you setting aside from the get-go to be able to fix this place up so that you don't jump in here and you're constantly digging into your reserves? So that, right there, if you said, what is your CapEx budget, that's already going to blow people's brain because 99% of agents are going to be like, CapEx? Uh, like, they have no idea. <laughs> so that's you planning on prepping that property. The other word is the cash flow, right? And you can say, okay, well, what's going to be your true cash flow on this? Do you plan on having a property manager? What kind of uh, regular maintenance do we have planned on here? You know, I usually do like $100 a door I anticipate a month for my uh, expenses. So I take that all off in a deal when I underwrite it. I cut that off, okay, about 100 bucks off here. Here's my maintenance fees. So I, that way I have fatter margins. So if things pop up, I'm still gonna be good. So understand your cash flow, what is true cash flow, what is sexy cash flow, understand what CapEx is and how you can be a benefit to that person. And then you can talk about what type of properties are they looking to uh, locate. So that's where you get into class A, B, and C. So class C is, there's probably shootings here, cokeheads live here, crackheads, it's a terrible neighborhood, it's rough, it's run down, it's beat up. Class B is like, okay, it's, it's, it's okay, it's nice, I can live here, it's good. And then class A is the like, has the swimming pool, has the you know the amenities that you'd have at that high level. So as an investor coming in, I mean, if y'all have Class A uh, clients that want to buy, I'll love, to, I'll take them. It makes sense to me. If it makes sense to them. But typically, unless they don't want to, they just want to deploy the money in the market. And there's different strategies because some people want to put their money out of the banks because even with these high interest savings accounts. The bank is eating your money. We have seen inflation jump up so much. It's finally starting to chill out a little bit the last time I looked at some numbers. But it is so wicked that if you have, we saw massive inflation rates and we're, we're told it's five to six percent at a time. But if we look at things like automobiles, housing, technology, it's um, your, your commodities that people are wanting where there's a high demand for it. We've seen, we've seen, your, your, we've seen everything depreciate essentially. Like there's been so much inflation that it'll eat up your bank account. So some people just wanna buy a class A because hey, I'm putting it into class A. This area doesn't have enough rentals, I'm putting it here. And these are the returns that I want. What is a good return? Your average return year over year um, your average return is 7% in like the stock market if you're doing good. If you're like, hey, if I can do 7% returns, like I'm doing well. So some investors will look at their cash on cash return on investment to say, if it's over seven, I'm good. I've talked with people that they, all they do is buy multifamily and they get investors come in. If they can get over a 7% return, they're like, I have investors left and right. Like I can move my hand on them. $20 million in like an afternoon. And I was like, wow, that's not awesome. Because you can have awesome returns when you buy something cash, you fix it up, you refinance it, and they pull it all out of you. And so it can go that way. So know their motivation of what they're looking to do. Are they looking just to put money into the real estate market? Or are they looking to buy something, fix it up, because that's going to blow up the values, and then maybe look to sell and, or down the road. Because if you are an agent and you're talking to somebody and they're saying, hey, I want to buy a 30 units class B, your brain needs to go, okay, these people want to buy something they can put value in and I need to talk to them. Typically, they'll hold it on average for five years. I need to talk to them in five years because they're going to grab a million dollar property. But by the time they're done with all the stuff they want to do, now I'm looking at a three, four million dollar property. So keep those relationships up, speak those languages. You're able to get in there and communicate effectively. You're going to be able to ask for whenever you're helping a client. Say, I'm going to ask for the P&Ls. I'm going to ask for, there's T3s, T6s, uh, and T12s. Uh, 3, 6, and 12. What those T stand for is just tracking. 
I want a tracking um, cash flow statement or your uh, your P&L, uh, rents, all that fun stuff. I, I need it for three months, for six months, and for 12 months. That's if they're sophisticated sellers. A, a lot that we see here, they won't have that. And it's like, well, buddy, they, they pay rent cash and they're always, you know, and so you have, there's a gamble at that, that lower class B property. But if you're dealing with 200, 300 units, whatever you get up there, you're absolutely going to need some T3, T6, and you need somebody sharp, sharp, sharp to be able to look at the numbers. The guy who I met, his family was in hotels, and he was the underwriter for this big group, and uh, he's just Mr. Numbers guy. Like He can get in there and go, okay, this is this, and if you look at the numbers, you can see where stuff is wrong. For instance, if you have a place that's for sale, and you ask for the T12, or they give you a T3, that means three months of the past rent, and everything's great, looks amazing. Wow, you know, cool, you have the T12. They take you a little bit to get it, and you finally get it, and you notice for the first six months, uh, property values are way, or the rents are way low, the maintenance is way high, and it's crazy, and then all of a sudden, the past three months, everything straightens up. Well, then your investor brain should be clicking, going, okay, well, why is this different? What have they boosted up? Are they letting people in that aren't qualifying now just so they can get rent so they can show more profit? You know, like, are they, are they not doing any more maintenance requests? Because ultimately, the more money you can save, the more money, the more profit you show, the more valuable the asset is. Multifamily is not like your home where you're like, oh, here's the market price. It is designed to make money. So even an appraiser that comes in is going to look at these things to be able to do that. So speak the language there. That is some initial stuff here. So we have cash flow, capital expenditures, your T3, T6, and T12s, uh, your profit and loss, your P&Ls, um, your rent rolls, all that fun stuff. This is all language that you will use when speaking with an investor, whether that's a single family, an Airbnb, uh, multifamily, whatever. This, that's the type of language that you're looking for. There is a little four square thing that I use if you want to see how to do cash on cash return on investment. I stole it for bigger pockets. Um, it has a little four square thing here. You list out all the income here, bam, 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 bam. And then you list out all of your expenses, taxes, insurance, water, property management, vacancies, whatever. And you get here, you put that cash flow uh, annually. So you multiply it by 12, then you get your annual loss here, and then you're going to put all your capex expenses, and then you divide it, and you do all this, and you get your cash on cash return on investment. So that's what I like to look at too whenever I'm deploying funds into the market. So I hope that was helpful on that side. Let's jump into 1031 exchanges. So what is a 1031 exchange? If you've heard it, um, you, you hear investors talk about it. Um, sometimes people will say something like, yeah, I'm gonna 1031 exchange it and do this and that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, totally. So 1031 exchange is actually named after the uh, IRS code of section 1031. Um, it is about you, anytime you sell a, an asset that makes you money, right? Because we all know if it's your personal asset and you live in it, was it two of the five years? Two out of the five years of owning it, you do not have to pay capital gains taxes. So. Capital gain taxes are the quickest steal, <laughs> thieves of wealth in this country. Taxes in general, you'll find the more wealthy that people get, the more clever they are of figuring out, all right, I need to learn this code so I can pay the less as possible, because if you do it dumbly, you will pay out the nose in taxes. So always obey the law and follow the IRS guidelines, but there are guidelines to help you with tax benefits. I'm not a financial advisor, please consult your CPA. <laughs> Uh, so that, that is on that side. So there is, there's a lot of benefits to, to not paying your taxes right away. So at 1031 exchanges, I have a duplex. I'm selling it. And I, I've had it for so long, it's made me so much money. I would like to buy another asset. So some, just some, some break points here. It has to be one that is similar to that or better. Like you can't then go, I'm gonna buy all these Airbnbs and that's short term, it, it has to be identified. So it's a tax break, um, ultimately. Um, yeah, I'll go through this here at the very end. It's kind of some bullet points. So understand that. Um, the, the first and foremost is this is you 
not getting out of taxes. It's you saying, don't worry, Uncle Sam, I'll pay those taxes later. So Uncle Sam's like, you know what? I'm a fair uncle, uh, and I want to make sure that you do it right. So here you go. you got 45 days. Huh, but uncle, I'll do it. No, you got 45 days. What that means is you have a timeline. So the moment that, how, that you get ready to go and you sell that, you have 45 days to identify a property. So I found this out. I didn't know this. The IRS says that you can actually designate three properties as long as you buy one of the three. So as soon as you sell and your clock is ticking, you're going, uh-oh, uh-oh. By the way, you cannot accept the funds. If you accept the funds, you've jacked up the 1031 exchange. Uh, Jessica Cook at Foundation Title has dealt with a lot of um, 1031 exchange. She can help get somebody who is, uh, what is it, a designator here, or somebody who, who you say, hey, I've identified a property. Qualified intermediary. Yeah, yeah, there you go, qualified intermediary. He's, he's done it a time or two. And so you are able to say, hey, here it is, here's the three properties I'm looking at. Once, they, once you have those funds from the sale of that house, right, or that your property, you put it into an escrow account. You don't touch it. It's like commingling. Remember, it's everybody's favorite vocabulary word when you do your real estate exam. Commingling. I can't take money out of the escrow account to pay Karen. I lose the company tomorrow if I do that, right? It's commingling. Money has touched. Escrow is escrow. That's why we tell y'all, hey, send it to the title company. Because that's why real estate companies get sued the most is for doing dumb stuff with escrow stuff. Whether dumb or silly, they think of it. Escrow, escrow, escrow. So the money you get goes into an escrow account, like say at Foundation. You go, here you go, Foundation, here you go, other title company. You hold it, lock it down. Now you gotta go find a property, right? Because you have 45 days to go lock it down. Once it's sold, you throw it in there, you're running around. Now you, there also is a 180 day rule. So you must close on the new property within 180 days of the sale of the old property. And I found this to be beneficial as well. The two time periods run concurrently, which means that you start counting when the sale of your property closes. For example, if you designate a property exactly 45 days later, now you have 135 days left to close on it. It's not 45 days and then 180 days. It all bleeds together. Just within that 180 day period, you have 45 days to go, ah, it's this one, it's this one, right? And get it locked down. Now you have that time to close on it. So if you don't close on it, you've got to pay, right? So this is what we talked about, how to report it here. So there's a form you can do here and all that fun stuff. Um, you have that person, like you mentioned there. What was the name of that again? Qualified intermediary. Qualified intermediary to say, hey, here's the properties that I'm doing it with. Now the properties here, I'm going to jump into it. It has to be similar. And it can't be it can't be too different. So you can't be like, I'm gonna sell my my tinplex, and then you go buy like a commercial building. Uh, it's it's designed just to, for like medical equipment. Like you'd have to get it approved from the IRS to be like, okay, that works. Otherwise, you're not playing the same game. They're gonna say, oh, cool, nice buy, mm, money. And hand it out. So make sure you're doing all that correct. Cause there's a lot of front end work. This isn't something that an investor should go. Yeah, so I've got like 50 days left. I need to buy something. You know, like, ah, like, this needs to be done. Like, when they go, hmm, I might sell soon. When it's on the market, you're hunting for a place so you can go and find it. So, the, the QI can tell you if what you're looking at is similar. Yeah. Like, if it falls into the, yep. the category. They'll be the one to give it a thumbs yeah, up and a thumbs down. Yeah. So, if they're like, no, nah, that didn't work, and you're like, but I think it should work, yeah. doesn't matter. They'll tell you ahead of time. So I get this a lot. A lot of people will say, can I just do a 1031 exchange in my principal residence? The short answer is kind of. <laughs> so really, you, you can't do it on your primary residence as a straight primary residence. So I'm going to read this here. So the principal residence usually does not qualify for this. But I did say usually. Because you live in that home, you don't have it for investment purposes. However, if you rented it out for a reasonable time period and refrain from living there, then it becomes an investment property, which potentially could make it eligible. So it sounds like typical IRS stuff. You gotta like, ooh, here's a little loophole. You can jump through it. But if it was your if it was your primary residence for the last 25 years, 
you have to find a place where you can get out of it, have some sort of rental background and go, oh yeah, it was used for some sort of rental purpose. And then there's the Augusta rule. I don't know if that applies. I don't know, Augusta, do you know what the Augusta rule is? The Augusta rule was made in, where's where Graham lives now? Because they have the big golf tournament over there. Mm -hmm. So people were renting out their houses for a decent period of time. And some of them were renting it out to their own companies to come stay in the house because they would buy houses over there. Well, it gives you a huge tax break on your own primary residence for doing that. So I don't know if that would consider being an investment property on that side, since it has a tax break, consult your CPA. There's a certain amount, I think there's a certain amount of years you have to have it leased out. Really? To be able to qualify. If you're living in it, Yeah. And then you want to turn it into a rental. There's, yeah, here, here there's it's like for sort of like a reasonable time period. Or something so like that, <laughs> that so we'll see what the reasonable time frame is. Yeah. yeah, I wonder what it is. What did they consider? I thought for some reason, for some reason, a five, five. Or eight years is sticking in my head, but I don't know if that's correct. Yeah, I wonder if you could do the Augusta rule and that counts, and then just on the eighth year. Uh, that's something to look into. I definitely look yeah, into that. Yeah, it's, it's like you said, usually you can't, but there's ways around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somehow. If you, if you <laughs> want it hard enough, you can figure out how to, to get around it. So, 1031 exchange in a second home, um, it's just the same thing. It has to be something that's making you money. So, if there's somebody that goes, I'm 1031 exchange in my house. Because um, I just bought it, so I'm going to 1031 exchange it and push those pack, those taxes back. And be like, mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. So that way they don't get all surprised. Because a lot of people, they'll hear it like, it's awesome, free money, cool, I'm going to pay taxes, and they just keep running. So ex example here, like I mentioned. Um, so they give us a Kim here. Kim owns an apartment building that's currently worth $2 million, double what she paid seven years ago. She's content until her real estate broker tells her about a larger condominium located in the area fetching higher rents. That's for $2.5 million. By using the 1031 exchange, Kim could, in theory, sell her apartment building and use the proceeds to help pay for the bigger replacement property without having to worry about the tax liability straight away. She's effectively left with extra money to invest in the new property by deferring capital gains taxes and depreciation recapture taxes. Right. So essentially here, the, the bottom line is you, you, there's rules you got to play by and you have to play with them by the, by the T. Because if Uncle Sam, like I said, he's fair, but he yeah, half wing fair a little bit. Like, he'll give you the tax break, you got to work hard for it. It's not something you slip into. Like, oh, I tend to want to exchange this on accident. Like, you have to very actively go through these things in order to not pay those taxes. So some people, and this is how I decide if I don't want to use a tax person or not, when I start talking about this, and they go, ah, well, you know, you're going to pay your taxes eventually, so I just do it up front. And I'm like, ah, like, I don't like that guy. Like, I like the guy with the vendetta against the IRS who wants to save as much money as possible. That's my guy. So, a lot of people will say, well, then, like, what happens to this amount? Because if I roll it in one time, now let's say I have capital gain taxes of, it was 40000 per person, and it was eighty. I roll it again, I roll it again, I roll it again. Some of these people that are buying, we're not buying like 400,000 apartment complexes anymore. Like we're buying two, three, 20, 30 million dollar apartment complexes. So when we're rolling these things in 1031 exchange, if you don't know what you're doing and they don't know what they're doing, there is a lot of money on the line. So absolutely like dive into that, make sure that or they're even on the market trying to sell theirs, that you're trying to locate something here and try to work something out over there and make sure that, it, hey, this is going to work. This is the plan. Am I doing this by the way, by the book? That's what you're going to want to do. Now, the cool thing about this is the reason why investors do this and the reason why people that are wealthy that do this is they can effectively not pay for the, the capital gains on this forever. Because it will get bigger and bigger as long as you keep doing it by the rules. But the cool thing is, I've heard this from a few folks, is when you die, what do you think happens? Does it go to your kids, go to your aunt, go to your spouse? It dies with you. So the debt dies with you. It doesn't get passed on to your children. So if we're looking to build generational wealth and we're passing off these taxes, I die, Ugh, my kids don't inherit the they inherit all my properties. They do not inherit the capital gains tax there. It starts over, bink, with the kids, right, of my current mortgage notes and rents and all that stuff. They get that, but the accumulated um, 
tax debt dies with me. So that's a cool asset. I know, I think there's some stuff about Biden talking about getting away with getting rid of 1031 or something like that too, or something, um, which would be a big upset um, in this area for investors. Uh, well, in the U.S. for investors. But we'll see. I haven't heard anything like firm on it. But just make sure you're up with those local uh, laws here. Currently, as it stands, people are using those to their advantage because, as you all know, everybody in here, um, you you pay a lot in taxes in here, and so you have to be pretty savvy with how you're doing it, um, what you're doing. So this is a great um, tax break asset for you there. So this language and this brief knowledge isn't enough to make you an expert in it, but it is enough to give you insight to be able to speak to an investor to where you're able to go, okay, even though you don't have to be an investor person, you might look at the idea of owning residential or rental properties as like, oh, that's a nightmare, I don't want to do that, I'd rather stick in the stock market or I'd rather invest in I don't know, whatever. I don't want to do that at all. Uh, it's great. If you want to work with investors and you like that, um, you have a lot of opportunity there to be able just to start this conversation. A lot Any questions? Okay, anything that you've heard from an investor that you were like, yeah, totally, and then you ran and called Lincoln or me or Joey or whatever and was like, hey, oh, you said this, what does it mean? Can you repeat the first half of the class? Sure. So, uh, <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do a quick little run down. So uh, cash flow, and so if your mortgage is at $1,000, rents come in at $1,500, you have $500 cash flow. I call that sexy cash flow. Because it's sexy, it doesn't show the the whole. It's not the whole picture. I don't have his, vacancy that's rates. His I'm copy pointing that. Copyrighted. <laughs> sexy cash flow. Because it's all you know. It looks great, but you got to look around and you're like, oh wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. I didn't see it first because you're all cut up, right? Yeah. You got your um, vacancies, uh, management fees, taxes, insurance, uh, maintenance. So then you want to let down. If you can have true cash flow, I like true cash flow of at least two hundred dollars a door. So that doesn't sound super sexy for like, cool, how much did you make for your own property this month? 200 bucks? But it's leverage. How much money did I put into it? How much money, what's my cash on cash return? And then how much can I keep repeating this? Because my current plan is at about 30 properties, I'll be, I'll be doing pretty good. Because yeah. you're like, yeah, cool, 200 times 30. Oh, it's making a lot more sense, yeah. right? Than at 201. So nobody is going to retire on one rental property. They're always looking for more and more in leverage, and that's where that conversation of leverage goes out well. Also, fun fact, as I dive into this, there's two schools of thought in real estate investing. Number one is high leverage, and then number two is the Ramses, the Ramses approach, right? So being in the Christian world as well, everybody's like, hey, Ramses, right? Uh, which, works, which works great for some folks. I'm not a giant fan because um, his approach is for you not to be a slave to credit cards, and that's it. The other ways, I don't know who would be coined to that, is the leverage way is to use debt to build your net worth and to pay you, as long as it's good debt. So don't go buy the new Mercedes Benz because it looks nice yeah. so that you can drive to your showings and look nice. It's buy the investment property that, yes, sure, like you're a million dollars in debt, but you make money on that and plus you're growing. So the three things that people are looking at, as I would talk about in the beginning, is you wanna have cash flow. Because I, I personally, I can't do it. I won't buy anything that's not cash flowing, unless I can flip it around real quick. Number two is appreciation. So where we see this is a lot of investors will be like, oh yeah, well, I could buy that double wide, it'll cash flow $500 a month, that's pretty great, well, cash on cash is great, that's awesome. Your appreciation is basically zero because it's double wide. Mm -hmm. The idea that it is a home and it is on land will appreciate, but the asset itself is a depreciating asset. It's a car, mm -hmm. you know, automobile, or automobile. So there's not a ton of appreciation there. And the last one is somebody else is paying down your debt. I love that. So when you have your mortgage, somebody else is paying that for you. They hand you money. <laughs> they hand you money. And then you just go right there to the bank. You go, yeah, thanks. And then what's left over? You're like, oh, cool. Put that into the, the property. And then, historically speaking, appreciation happens. So, like, that's what we're all seeing right now. The homes that you all sold five years ago are coming back on the market. And you're like, that's 350 
what do you mean? You know, you're going back and finding when you sold it. And you're like, I sold it for 185. What's happening? So appreciation in that time there too. If you, it's called the buy and hold strategy. If you buy and hold, you get somebody else to pay off your debt, cash flow from it, it continues to grow. You get to where you're at retirement age, and the things that you bought either you're they're already paid off, and if you're a true buy and hold, you've already refinanced them to buy other deals. <laughs> as long as they cash flow, you're able to leverage yourself to get more capital, to buy more things, and then as the clock ticks, you're going to make more money than the, the Dave Ramsey person that goes, I have to buy all of my assets in cash. Because by the time you save up, or even if he says 20% or 30%, by the time you save up and do that, the buy and hold guy who's into leverage has already leveraged his, um, leveraged himself to where he can buy other cash flowing assets and he just has them on the clock. Another fun thing I want to throw in here just blew my mind is everybody is afraid of inflation right now. Inflation is a debt killer with good debt. So what I mean by that is inflation is going crazy. Like I love using, everybody says, oh, 5 or 6%. Well, look at a cell phone. Remember when y'all could buy it? We could buy a cell phone, like a good one for like 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. Like $1,500 now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's bananas. But like that is massive, massive inflation, right? So we're seeing a lot of that happen with things here. And so like we have to be mindful of inflation is happening. There's nothing you can do at it, about it at this level. The only thing you can do is buy cash flowing assets and lock in an interest rate. Especially if you can like owner financing stuff like that. If you can lock anything under five, you're beating inflation. You're actually making money just by having it there. So what I mean by that is inflation is killing your debt because if I buy a property for $400,000 at a 3% note, which we had a lot of clients do back in the, you know, two years ago, a year ago, at 3% interest, they have now locked in a 30-year fixed rate with the bank. Sure, they can do fractionalized banking and all their cool tricks. You can't do that. But you've locked them in for 30 years with an unchanging rate. Inflation can go through the roof, and that's why people, they go to look at the amortization table, oh, it'll make you sad. I don't make me sad. Do you think a dollar is, is going to be worth what a dollar is today, 30 years from now? Uh -uh. Think about where houses were 30 years from now. Yeah. So I'm still holding on to the same amount of money for 30 years. Meanwhile, money is being poured in, the debt ceiling is being raised. So if more money is put into circulation, I still have mine locked down. I actually end up owing less. It starts killing my debt because wages are going up as inflation is going up. But I've locked in that 30-year interest rate. So that's why I'm a big fan of, of those things. That's why the, the Fed, we're up at 7. It's like, okay, we can kind of keep up at this level. Like we were at a high interest rate because of that. But when they get back down to the fives, I'm like, cool, buy on fives all day long. Buy on five, six, buy it down as long as you're going to hold it for 30 years as long as it makes sense on the cash on cash that you want. So a lot of fun stuff in that, being able to understand that and engage in that type of conversation will be super helpful and lucrative. Uh, capital expenditures, talk about that. It's like, what's your CapEx budget for this project? So if I like a big commercial property, if somebody wants to buy, like, oh, what kind of CapEx are you looking at? Is there anything you want to change? That's immediately coming in, that's like us, our CapEx is putting up walls, putting on a new roof, things like that as CapEx, and then our general maintenance is make sure the AC works, make sure the lights stay on, all that stuff. So capital expenditures, cash flow, cash on cash return on investment, uh, profit and loss or P&L, uh, your T3s, T6, and T12s, so it means tracking, so you're looking at their profit and loss for tracking three months, tracking six months, tracking 12 months, so that you can accurately look at that. And again, that's with a sophisticated seller or somebody that has a property management company that is keeping good metrics of everything. That's why a lot of these guys will do that, so they have good metrics of their books so they can go, here's how much I make. Oh. So that's why you're going to want to see those with an investor. No investor is going to buy a property without seeing profit and loss. So That's it. Hopefully that will help you speak the language a bit better and you can understand 1031 Exchange a little bit more in the investor world. Um, if you have any questions or want to holler at me, holler at me. If I don't know, I'm going to ask Tim. If Tim don't know, I'll ask Gary. Yeah. Appreciate y'all. Any questions?